the Affordable Care Act uh, was uh, up for review for over a year, hundreds of hearings and thousands, essentially, of meetings around this country. This has not had a single town meeting, a single hearing, and a single perspective around this I country. I yield the whip an additional one minute. I thank the gentleman for yielding. So my Tea Party friends, I'm sure you lament the fact and think this bill ought not to be passed. But I haven't seen you. I haven't heard you. I haven't gotten a letter from you. I tell my friends on the Republican side of the aisle, I have demonstrated throughout this year that when we had the opportunity to work together, I worked to get the votes so we could pass legislation together necessary to run this country. So I don't take a seat, a back seat to anybody in this chamber willing to work together in a bipartisan fashion. But this bill was not worked together in a bipartisan fashion. This bill seeks to poke the fingers in the eye of the President of the United States, who has said, I will veto this bill. Not because of the three things that I said were absolutely essential to pass, but because of something that is not essential to pass. Now, the Majority Leader uh, lamented last week that this was 5,000 jobs if we passed uh, this uh, Keystone Pipeline. But a bill that would create at least a million jobs, the American Jobs Act, lays languishing in the bowels of the committee. Regular order, Mr. Speaker. Well, you got any additional time? The gentleman. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. So I can conclude. Yes, the gentleman asked for regular order. I lament the fact that we're not pursuing regular order. We could act in a responsible, bipartisan fashion to accomplish the three objectives I set forth and the appropriation bills. But no, we're playing politics. We're pandering to a base. We're having a pretense that this bill can pass. It cannot. Let us defeat this bill, and then let us come together in a responsible fashion, as the American public wants us to do, and act on their behalf, not on the behalf of our politics. And I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. The gentleman's expired. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from Montana, Mr. Regal. Regal. recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the sponsor of the Keystone Pipeline language, I support H.R. 3630. And no, it doesn't put a block of coal in the socks. It puts a barrel of oil in a pipeline. In fact, it puts 150,000 barrels of oil in the pipeline daily. The American people need jobs. They want Congress to work together to help the private sector create those jobs. Keystone XL is shovel ready. It will create thousands of jobs. All we need is a federal permit, something that's already taken three years. So why have the President and his allies in the Senate said no to these jobs? It's not for the cost. The project is privately funded to the tune of $7 billion. It's not to protect the environment. This pipeline will utilize the cleanest and safest new technology available, making it the safest pipeline in America. And it's not private property concerns. 97% of the landowners came to friendly settlements in earlier Keystone efforts. Frankly, there is no excuse. This is pure politics. And with thousands of jobs hanging in the balance, it's time to put politics aside and do the right thing. Yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. Now my privilege to you. Two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, who's the lead sponsor on our unemployment insurance bill, Mr. Doggett. Jones recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman. Uh, this proposal certainly does uh, represent a visit from the ghost of Christmas past, last Christmas to be specific, when Republicans stood here and said, only a lump of coal for the unemployed unless you stuff every stocking to overflowing. Well, today's Republican bill would eliminate up to 40 weeks of unemployment coverage with the biggest cuts coming in states like mine, Texas, with high unemployment rates. That means that next year, over three million unemployed Americans and their families will be shortchanged if this bill is enacted. Long-term unemployment in America today is at its highest level uh, for so long uh, in 60 years. We have over six million fewer jobs now than when the recession began and more than four workers for every job opening. 
And in 10 states, this bill responds by making it possible to no longer require that unemployment insurance funds are used for unemployment insurance benefits. Under the Democratic alternative that I have introduced, unemployment would be available only to those who are actively searching for a job, getting job training, uh, or who are out there in a temporary layoff situation. Nor is an unemployment check any substitute for a paycheck. As the New York Times editorialized this morning, when was the last time that any Republican lawmaker tried to live on $289 a week the amount of the average unemployment benefit? And this same measure also offers a lump of coal for Medicare. I believe in seeking efficiencies in Medicare. That's why we voted for the Affordable Care Act to ensure that billions of dollars were saved. But the billions that are cut from other health care providers in today's bill come on top of across-the-board cuts that are already enacted and to be effective within the next year. Do you have another 15 seconds? Yeah. At kitchen. some point, cuts to hospitals and nursing homes mean that seniors and the disabled will be unable to access the quality care that they need. And this bill's $8 billion cut to preventable chronic disease programs like heart disease and diabetes is short-sighted and will cost us more in the long run than it saves. I yield back. Time the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. At this time, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Renacci. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you to the gentleman for yielding. I would like to thank Chairman Camp and Chairman Davis for their hard work on the much-needed reforms to our unemployment insurance program. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reported today that there are over 3.3 million job openings in America. According to studies earlier this year, 22 percent of American businesses and 57 percent of small businesses are looking for employees and are ready to hire if they can just find the right people. Matching willing employers with able workers is an absolute must. In this uncertain economy, helping to cover the risk of training a new employer employee will help get the unemployed back to work. Using unemployment dollars to subsidize that training of a new employee to re-enter the workforce is just good public policy. In June, I was proud to introduce the Bipartisan Support Employee Act to give states the fl flexibility to do precisely this. I remain very proud today that my concept is included in this package and support this bill, which gives states like Ohio the flexibility to use unemployment dollars for job training services, and I want to thank the cha chairman for working with me. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. I now yield two minutes to the very distinguished member of our committee, Mr. Lewis from the state of Georgia. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my friend, my colleague, Mr. Levin, for yielding. And thank you for all your great and good work. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to this bill. It is a very sad day for this body. Day in and day out, unemployed Americans beat the pavement, applying for jobs everywhere and anywhere, sending hundreds of resumes applying for many jobs. These people lost their jobs through no fault of their own. They don't want a handout. They want a job. In Atlanta, we had a job fair where more than 4,500 people from as far away as New York showed up with the hope of just getting an interview. This bill is an insult to them. It is an affront to their dignity. It says that millions of Americans do not want to work, that they are not such an hard enough for a job. Instead of extending unemployment benefits before the holiday break, giving equal tr treatment for struggling Americans as we do for the wealthy and large corporation, this legislation stripped programs, these programs, down to its bones. This is not right. It is not fair. It is not just. This body represents the people. And we should not stump on the soul of our fellow citizens. We can do better. We must do better. We must do better for the sake of our fellow citizens. 
Mr. Speaker, is this the spirit of the season? Last night, we offered an amendment to the Rules Committee that the Republican refused to even consider. These amendments said, in effect, stop the politics, stop the games, stand up for the people, for the people that voted for us, for our people that need our help. They're depending on us. 30 seconds. Yes, you know, 30 seconds. Mr. Speaker, we should stay here. Stay here. Don't go home, but stay here until we can meet the expectation. We must come together. Let's do what is right and do it now. I urge all of my colleagues to oppose this bad deal and come together. Pass a long-term clean extension of unemployment benefits. That's the thing to do. Time gentleman expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Uh, we think it's important to extend unemployment benefits, and that's what this bill does. But we do it with common sense reforms, reforms that will help those who are unemployed get not just a paycheck from the government, but to get a job and get a paycheck from the private sector. These common sense reforms are things like requiring unemployment uh, insurance recipients to search for work. And if they don't have a GED, to get a GED, but with, with you know, GED, but we have a common sense exception, exception provision so that if you're an older worker and you've, you've been a pipe fitter for 30 years, well, obviously a GED is, isn't going to help you in your job search. But for those who are younger, who don't have the skills they need, they, it, it's clear that if you have that, that certificate, your chances of losing your job are much less. And third, we think they should participate in services to get them reemployed. Those are important. States need more flexibility in this area to get waivers from the federal government so they can enter in reemployment re re programs. There are many ideas in the states out there. We aren't mandating this from Washington. We want the states to be the laboratories of invention here. We also think it's important to allow states to screen applicants for drugs. There's been a 1960s Department of Labor ruling that's saying states can't even look at this area. Look, with screening, you can get workers the proper help so they're not bounced from a job because they fail a drug test or don't get hired because they fail a drug test. These are all important common sense reforms, and they will help reduce our unemployment rates. They will help people get jobs. And let me just say in terms of job search, um, it is important that people, uh, that there be requirements in legislation to do that. Florida, for example, now requires those claiming benefits to report online each week for the, job, for the five jobs they've applied for or they've met with a, a job counselor. The result, the first three months of the new law, 65% of the claimants did not meet that obligation. Well, they need to be out there assisting uh, and finding uh, jobs that they need. Now, w those, those are then keeping those resources for those who truly are unemployed, who, who truly can't find a job. In this era of limited resources, we need to make sure that they're used in the best, most effective, most efficient possible way. And these common sense reforms that give states the flexibility to design programs that meet the needs of their state, whether it be in drug screening, whether it be in searching for work, whether it be in reemployment services, or even states designing programs that allow employers to receive part of the unemployment check so the worker gets hired. Those are the kinds of innovations that don't happen in Washington because they're saying just extend the 99 weeks as is. Well, we, we can't afford to continue to deficit spend as, as the other party did $100 billion worth since 2008 of unpaid for unemployment benefits. This is an important program. It's an important program that must be extended. It should be extended. It will be extended if my colleagues vote for this legislation, and I urge support. Chairman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. I yield my show 30 seconds. Mr. Camp, we've just received information from the Department of Labor that the Republican bill would cut unemployment benefits 
for 3.3 million Americans next year compared to an extension of current law. In the name of reform, don't cut the rug out from the unemployed of this country who are looking for work. That is, in one word, inexcusable. Inexcusable. I now yield two minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquale. The chair would remind all members to direct his or her comments to the chair, and the gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to commend uh, Mr. Camp and Mr. Levin for working hard on these issues. I think they do put, try to put the country before the party. But this bill is terrible. It is terrible. The holidays must have come early for the majority. When we have here, what we have here is a serious proposal. It's a stocking stuffed to the brim with ideology. And I thought we could put that aside and put the country first. More important than parties, more important than ideology. I agree with you. Let's weed out those people who literally are crooks and try to steal from the public trough and, and take advantage of unemployment. But I went to an unemployment office yesterday, and I went to, in my area, in my district, major city, Patterson, I went to the center, unemployment center, I looked through all of those folks that were waiting online and working and looking and seeking work and being trained for specific jobs, particularly in health care. I looked through those records. And if you think you're going to reduce the amount of money that Americans have to spend to help their brothers and sisters, you are dead wrong, dead wrong. What we've done in the Bush tax cuts, they were for the least needy. Now we're talking about the most needy. The unemployment rate in New Jersey is 9.1 percent. The average in the, in the United States, rather, is 8.6 percent. I'm asking you, I'm begging you, let's get beyond this. And why didn't we put employers in this? What if employers had their part shaved, like the employee that we are suggesting here? What about how many jobs would be created if the employer had not to pay 6.2 but instead of 4.2 percent? And I agree with the President, that should have been reduced to 3.1 percent. We could put a lot of people to work. A thousand dollars may be in your pocket, or my pocket, or your pocket, Mr. Speaker, may not be the end all, but a thousand dollars in many people's who work every day for a living, who love this country, is not, is an insult. And we're not just making matters worse, Mr. Speaker. We are not making them better. Time the gentleman's expired. I yield. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp. At this time, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent for Mr. Upton to control 15 minutes of the time. Is there objection? Without objection, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, will control 15 minutes. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Speaker, I would yield myself two minutes. The gentleman's recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, this bill does a lot of things. It has real reforms. It's driven in large part by the unemployment reforms, extending the payroll tax, and it's cut, uh, payroll tax cut, and it's all paid for. You know, most Americans don't really want unemployment. They want a job. The spectrum provisions in this bill help our first responders with the allocation of the D-block and creates perhaps as many as 100,000 jobs. The Keystone Pipeline decision is part of this bill, too. It requires the president to review and make a decision either way within 60 days of enactment. Just this morning, there were a number of press accounts that perhaps Iran will soon be conducting exercises to close the Straits of Hormuz. The Keystone Pipeline will connect Canadian oil sands with refineries here in the United States, adding 20,000 private sector jobs, and perhaps as many as 118,000 indirect jobs. It reduces our reliance on non-North American oil, which is a good thing. And it brings perhaps as many as a billion barrels of oil, a million barrels of oil a day, a million barrels a day into the United States that we don't have to import from someplace else. Canada is going to develop this no matter what. And that oil is either going to come a million barrels a day, 
It's either going to come to the United States or it's going to go to a place like China. We want it here. This is a good thing. It creates jobs, it reduces our reliance on uh, oil from overseas, and it is something that ought to be part of this uh, bill, and it is, and I would urge my colleagues to support it, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. I now yield two minutes to another member of our committee, a distinguished active member indeed, Mr. Crowley of New York. Gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague and friend from the state of Michigan, Mr. Levin, for yielding me this time. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to H.R. 3630. Today, the Republican Party's true colors are fully exposed and on display, and it isn't pretty. The GOP argues time and time again against tax increases, but now it's clear that policy only applies when we are talking about increasing taxes on those making over a million dollars a year. Now, I don't begrudge anyone for making a buck in this country. I do, however, begrudge those who want to help America's wealthiest at the expense of America's middle class, especially when, we're t when working people are hurting so much as they are right now. Where is the shared sacrifice? Where is the shared responsibility? I believe Americans of all economic classes want a federal government that has a vision for our future a vision for how to keep America strong. That is why Democrats have a plan to provide an immediate cut in middle class taxes. We are pushing to cut the payroll tax in half for all working people, as well as expand it to small businesses, the engine creating, uh, creator of jobs in America. Unfortunately, this GOP bill denies any payroll tax relief to small businesses. My friends on the other side of the aisle argue taxes impede growth, hurt American businesses, and stunt our economy. But apparently those arguments don't apply when we're talking about lowering taxes for the middle class or small businesses. President Obama and the Democratic Party are championing cut, cutting the payroll tax in half for all workers. My Republican rep colleagues refuse to even consider that. Democrats want to expand and enhance the payroll tax cut for, all, for, for, for employers. Yet there's no such relief for small businesses in this bill. But aside from what is not in this bill, I also want to object to what is in this bill, a new tax on senior citizens. If this bill is signed into law, seniors' premiums for Medicare will go up and go up dra dramatically. The true colors of the Republicans are clear. Seniors making $40,000 a year, can I just have additional 15 seconds? Yes, you have additional 15 seconds. Seniors making $40,000 a year are considered wealthy and deserve to see their Medicare costs go up but a small temporary income tax surcharge on people earning a million dollars a year, that's not acceptable? Let's reject this bill. Hard-working Americans deserve better. They deserve middle-class tax relief that doesn't come at the expense of our seniors. I yield back. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. <clears throat> May I inquire the chair how much time is available on each side? Mr. Upton has 13 minutes remaining. Right. Mr. And then with Mr. Camp, there's Ms. a total of 18. Mr. Uh, Levin has 19. 19 minutes remaining. Okay. Mr. Camp has four and one half minutes remaining. At this point, I will yield two minutes to the chairman of the uh, communications uh, subcommittee, Mr. Walden. Gentleman from Oregon, direct now for two minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Speaker. The American people have waited long enough for this Congress to act to create jobs. This legislation does that. It does that through the Jump Starting Opportunity and Broadband Spectrum Act of 2011. There is no reason to de delay this bill any further. This unleashes spectrum, both licensed and unlicensed, and when put into service will unleash new technologies, new innovations, and the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission has said this part of the bill we're debating today could create as many as 700,000 new jobs. Other estimates say between 300,000 and 700,000 American jobs. It generates upwards of $16 billion from companies who want to buy this broadband and pay the taxpayers for it, because it is America's spectrum. And it does something that the Democrats, when they were in charge of the House for four years, failed to do. It makes this spectrum available, and it begins the process of building out an interoperable public safety broadband network as called for by the 9-11 Commission. 
Now, this legislation didn't just drop out of the sky. It's thoughtfully and creatively and crafted, and it finds the right balances. Its provisions were improved as the result of input and counsel from five separate public hearings. We held 11 months of negotiations and discussions with members of both sides of the aisle, the FCC and the NTIA. But at some point, the American people say, stop talking, get it done. And that's what this legislation does as part of this bigger bill. Hardworking, middle-class taxpayers want transparency, accountability. They don't want a blank check to anybody. So this legislation has the proper protections for the taxpayers. It builds out the public safety network. It creates 300 to 700,000 American jobs. Our economy needs the help. Americans need the jobs. And we need to generate revenue for the American taxpayer in a productive way as this does. This legislation does all these things and does them well. I urge your support of this legislation. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman, time's expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. Yeah, thank you. I now yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Gentleman's recognized for one minute. Thank you. As I'm preparing to speak, I'm thinking about a debate we had here three years ago where banks received $700 billion, about the Fed a, a month ago printing $7.7 .7 trillion for banks in this country and abroad. And here we're telling the American people who happen to be unemployed, you know, we're thinking of cutting benefits 40 weeks. People want work, not welfare. People want work, not unemployment compensation. But when people do not have work, unemployment insurance is essential. It is a lifeline. And this legislation significantly cuts unemployment insurance, that safety net that millions rely on. It reduces the number of weeks unemployed workers are eligible for uh, by as much as 40 weeks. We need, there's, we need more jobs, and yet we have more long-term unemployed. We know the unemployment rate is actually uh, higher because people have stopped looking for work. Nearly 14 million Americans are out of work. And among the long-term unemployed, more than half have been out of work for over a year. The problem is not a lack of effort for those seeking a job. The problem is a lack of jobs. Let's get America back to work, not be cutting unemployment compensation. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. K Mr. Upton. Yield at this point uh, two minutes to the chairman of the health subcommittee, Mr. Pitts, from Pennsylvania. Gentleman recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, we are all well aware of the inadequacies of the sustainable growth rate formula as a payment policy for reimbursing physicians. Unfortunately, the greatest threat, arguably, facing the Medicare program if not the entire health care system, was left out of the new health reform law. In 2010, Congress passed five temporary fixes to a pending physician payment cut. Some were retroactive and some lasted mere weeks. In other words, Congress kicked the can down the road five times last year. Physician practices need more certainty than week-to-week -week patches. When this legislation becomes law, it will be the first multi-year fix to Medicare physician rates since 2003. Instead of just addressing the next oncoming payment cliff, the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act provides a level of stability and predictability in payments for providers not seen in years and will allow Congress and the administration to work together to develop a long-term answer to the Medicare sustainable growth rate. This two-year fix, with a 1% increase in the next two years, is the first step in a long-term solution to eliminate the SGR and develop a more equitable and affordable Medicare payment policy for physicians. Not voting for this and supporting this two-year fix may leave physicians facing just a one-year patch or more kicking the can down the road with no plan on how to move forward. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation. I yield back. Jim yields back. It's now my Mr. privilege Mr. to yield one minute to the very distinguished gentlelady from California, Lynn Woolsey. Gentlelady is recognized for one minute. And thank you for yielding to me, sir. Well, I walked in the shoes of those who are needy. I know what it's like to go without. I know what it's like to struggle. Forty years ago, I found myself, no fault of my own, 
a single mother with three young children, all under the age of five, and barely a dime to my name. I was one of the lucky ones. I had a good education, and so I was able to get a job, and I didn't need unemployment benefits. But my job wasn't enough to feed those three little kids. I needed AFDC just to make ends meet. Nobody asked me to take a drug test. Nobody asked if I had a GED. I was in trouble, and a generous, compassionate government helped me get back on my feet. That was over 40 years ago, my friends, and I can assure you that my children and I have more than paid back for that generous help that we received. The Republican bill is not consistent with American values as I've lived them and understood them during my 74 years on this earth. We're all in this together, I believe. There but for the grace of God go I. It's, additional 30 seconds. it's time for this Congress to stop coddling millionaires and start standing up for all families and all children who are suffering in today's economy. And with that, I yield back. I yield back. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Can I ask you, inquire again on the time? I think we're a little ahead. Do you want to... I think we're a couple minutes ahead. Maybe I'll let Gentleman you from Michigan, Mr. Upton, has nine minutes remaining. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, has 16 and three-quarter minutes remaining. And the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, retains four and one-half minutes. Oh, now we yield one minute to the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell. The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. I'd like to thank the ranking member Levin for allowing me this time. Today I rise in strong opposition to H.R. 3630, which makes dramatic and harmful changes to the emergency unemployment compensation program. It makes significant cuts to Medicare that would hurt our nation's seniors. This bill contains political and controversial language that should be discussed and debated in a separate legislation. Before Congress breaks for this year, we need to pass a bill that solely focuses on extending relief to the unemployed workers and middle-class Americans who are still suffering in this recovering economy. This is not the time to play with the livelihood of millions of Americans. Our voters sent us here to make their lives better, not more difficult. We were sent here to create jobs and stimulate the economy and protect our most vulnerable. To accomplish these goals, it will require a willing and compromising spirit. The folks of the 7th Congressional District of Alabama that I am so proud to represent want me to put people before politics and do what is in their best interest and not partisan interests. The American people expect and deserve more, not less from us. Therefore, I urge my colleagues to vote no on H.R. 3630. Thanks. Yeah. Gentlemen, Mr. I know ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, will control 10 minutes of my time. Is there objection? Without objection, the gentleman from California will control 10 minutes of the time. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Mr. Speaker, at this point I would yield two minutes to the chairman of the Environment and the Economy Subcommittee, Mr. Shimkus uh, from Illinois, for two minutes. Gentleman from Illinois is recognized for two minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my friend from uh, Ohio came down. He said, you know, what we need, what America needs is jobs. And so that's the important aspect of, of bringing the Keystone XL pipeline in this debate. Listen, don't listen to me. Listen to my friends in organized labor. Brent Brookers, Director of Construction Department of Labor's International Union of North America, said in testimony, for many members of the laborers, this project is not just a pipeline, it's a lifeline. David Barnett, United Association of Journeymen and Apprentices, said, the fact of the matter is Keystone XL would, upon completion, be the most environmentally safe pipeline anywhere in America. And then Jeffrey, Jeffrey Soth of the International Union of Operating Engineers said, Without the Keystone XL pipeline, American crude oil from the Bakken Formation, the fastest growing oil field in the United States, will continue to move out of the region in the most dangerous, most expensive way possible by tanker truck. Folks, this is about jobs. 
we're fortunate to be able to place this in, in this bill. 20,000 immediate jobs, 110,000 additional jobs. Um, I stood outside a refiner and I asked people, where do you think the crude oil comes in and how does the refined product go out? In any refinery in this uh, country, it's done through pipelines. So the Keystone XL pipeline is a job creator. Organized labor is strongly behind this. It creates 20,000 immediate jobs. And you know what? It's the best form of stimulus because we're not borrowing money and it's not a government project. So I appreciate uh, what my colleagues have done, including in this bill. I thank them. I organize labor friends. Uh, thank you. And I yield back the balance of my time. Two yields back. Gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself three minutes. Gentleman's recognized. I strongly oppose this legislation as presently structured and urge its defeat. There's no question that we must extend the payroll tax breaks which puts money in the hands of most Americans so they can spend it and get our economy moving. We must make sure that unemployed people have the insurance so that they have a lifeline so they can pay their bills while they're looking for jobs. We have to keep our promises to those under Medicare to uh, allow physicians to be adequately reimbursed. But the the price that the Republicans are imposing through this legislation is simply unacceptable. It contains dangerous poison pills, series of riders and legislative provisions that can never pass the Senate or be signed by the President. The Republicans are trying to cram them through the back door by holding this bill hostage. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Republicans holding things hostage. It's what they did when we had to raise the debt ceiling or default on our debts and they held that bill hostage to try to get some of their demands. The provisions to pay for the Medicare reimbursement for doctors would be paid for through a 170,000 reduction of people who are now covered and causing them to be uninsured. We'd increase the already high out-of-pocket cost for Medicare beneficiaries and subject a full quarter of Medicare beneficiary to significant higher premiums. Reducing our commitment to public health and prevention activities is a prescription for more diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and obesity. But that's what the Republicans would have us do in this bill. The Keystone XL tar sands pipeline has nothing to do with this legislation. It has to do with environmental concerns that the president is presently reviewing in an orderly manner. And the Republicans would have the whole process short-circuited by demanding that he come to the conclusion that the Canadian pipeline owners and maybe the Koch brothers would like, but not a, con a conscientious review of what this would do throughout this country and how it would affect our environment. The spectrum provisions are flawed. While they provide for spectrum auction incentives, the deployment of a public safety broadband network and address spectrum usage by federal agencies, there are many shortcomings in the governance provisions of, the, of how the public safety network would work or how the spectrum auctions will take place or extraining, extraneous provisions undercutting the open inter internet and limits on the FCC's ability to provide competitive safeguards and funding levels that short threaten to short change the public safety network itself. I, urge my, I, re I yield myself another 30 seconds. This bill uh, is uh, uh, a filled with loopholes and riders and special interest provisions and I would think that uh, it's a very bad process to throw this bill on the House floor. Some of the provisions that came out of our committee never had full committee consideration. So I urge members to defeat the bill. Let's get down to doing what needs to be done. Don't hold important measures that must pass hostage. Let's work together and get a decent bill and pass it into law at this late stage of the year. Reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I'd yield two minutes to the co-chair of the DOC Caucus and a member of the Health Subcommittee, Dr. 
Phil Gingry, two minutes from Georgia. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman for, yield, for yielding. Physicians will see a 27.4% decrease in Medicare payments if we fail to act before the new year. If Congress fails to act, seniors may find that no physician in their area can afford to accept their Medicare card. That is not the holiday cheer our seniors deserve. This bill is not perfect. As a medical doctor, I would prefer to be voting today on a permanent fix to this flawed physician payment formula Medicaid known as SGR, but I do not have that choice. My choice, Mr. Speaker, is simple. Vote for the physician fix or vote against it. Vote in support of my former patients whose need, who need access to their doctor when they're sick or vote against them. Vote to open up spectrum availability and bolster job creation within a growing telecommunications marketplace or vote against it. Vote for timely approval of the Keystone XL pipeline and, yes, create 20,000 immediate jobs along with domestic energy independence or vote against that. Allow the EPA to enact job-killing boiler mac rules on every state and every industry in the United States or vote to rein them in. Today I will be voting yes for the constituents of the 11th District of Georgia and for my country. And with that, I yield back. Jim yields back. Gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I yield at this time two minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Last year, the Republicans refused to extend unemployment benefits unless the Bush tax cuts were extended for millionaires and billionaires. Well, here they go again, Mr. Speaker. This year, the Republicans are trying to prevent continuation of jobless benefits and the payroll tax cut unless their wish list of goodies for America's biggest polluters is granted in full. During this Christmas season, instead of gold and frankincense and myrrh, the Republicans are bearing gifts of arsenic and mercury and oil on behalf of their planet-polluting patrons, big oil and big coal. The GOP used to stand for grand old party. Now it stands for gang of polluters. Now it stands for the gas and oil party. This Republican bill won blocks and indefinitely delay standards that would reduce hazardous air pollution like lead and cancer-causing substances that are released from industrial boilers and sent to the lungs of the children of America. Two, Russia's approval for the Keystone Pipeline that will bring the dirtiest oil on the planet through the United States so it can be re-exported to other countries while hurting our health and our environment here. And three, cuts much-needed Medicare payments to hospitals to care for the sickest in our country. The Republicans are presenting a false choice to the American people. We should not have to choose between toxic chemicals and tax relief for American workers. We should not have to choose between pollution and prosperity. In this Republican-controlled House of Representatives, billionaires, big oil, Big bankers benefit while the rest of America bears the burden. Enough is enough. We know we need to pass the middle class tax cuts. We know we need to extend unemployment benefits. If we fail to act, Congress will leave a giant legislative lump of coal in the stockings of struggling Americans. It is unacceptable. Bad for children, bad for the elderly, bad for the unemployed. Bad for America. The gentleman's expired. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I would yield at this point uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry. The gentleman from Nebraska is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, it just seems logical that as we have a bill to extend unemployment insurance for those unemployed, that we also have a measure for them to become employed, and that's the Keystone Pipeline. It is a $7 billion infrastructure project that is ready to start today, employing as many as 20,000 laborers, mostly labor uh, union labor, by the way. Now, not only will it employ, but the delays of the State Department 
in the White House in permitting this project is costing jobs. And I refer to Little Rock uh, Fox, for, uh, Fox Channel 16. There's their online story. It says layoffs in a brief company showdown is what, or shutdown, is what employees face at well-spun tubular company which makes steel pipes for the oil industry. Company leaders may uh, say miles of pipeline are on the property and that has caused five dozen employees to lose their jobs. The pipes would be part of the Keystone Oil Pipeline, which is a project running from Canada to Texas. The president has said that he would veto this bill extending unemployment and his tax holiday if this Keystone Jobs Bill was put in it. Mr. President, this is about creating jobs. Please join us. Also, they said that the State Department may have to say no because they're rushed, but this is the same State Department that back in June testified before our committee that they could have the decision made on this pipeline and permitted by, de well, the decision made on this pipeline by December 31st. The environmental studies have been there for a month. This application has been with the State Department for three and a quarter years. The State Department has everything they need to make a correct recommendation for the President, and I yield back. Time gentlemen's expired. Members are again reminded to direct their comments to the chair. Gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased at this time to yield to the man who's going to be the chairman of the Health Subcommittee when the public gets a chance next year to vote out the Keystone cop, Cops overreaching Republicans who are doing it again to the American people. Two minutes, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Gentleman's recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. You know, Mr. Waxman said before that essentially uh, the Republicans putting up this bill are not serious. They know that this bill is not going to pass the Senate. They know that the President won't sign it. And when I heard my colleagues on the other side talk about how, well, we have a deadline of December 31st and basically said take it or leave it, well, they're not serious. That's not the way this House and this Congress works. If you want to get something done by this December 31st deadline, you need to work with the Democrats, work with the Senate, and come up with something. And I know that that's not what's happening here today. I mean, this idea that basically you say we're going to give you extended unemployment benefits, but we're going to cut back on the number of weeks, or that we're going to uh, 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 extend the payroll tax, and we're going to come up with a dock fix, but we're going to pay for it by dismantling the Affordable Care Act. First, they cut, the Republicans cut the tax credits to help make insurance affordable, resulting in 170,000 additional people becoming uninsured. Then they slashed the Public Health and Prevention Fund, damaging efforts to realign the nation's approach to health care. Then they cut hospitals, affecting services that seniors depend on. And finally, they increased the premiums under Medicare, resulting in millions of middle class seniors having to pay more for health care. Now, we have a Democratic substitute that they wouldn't allow in order. And that Democratic substitute takes a very different approach. Unlike the Republicans, the Democratic substitute simply extends tax cuts for 160, American, 160 million Americans. It extends unemployment insurance to help Americans stay afloat financially while they're out seeking work. And it ensures doctors in Medicare don't face large reductions next year and maintains access for seniors with a permanent SGR fix. And it does all of this by asking 300,000 people making more than a million dollars a year to pay their fair share and by capturing offshore contingency funds. So if you want to actually pass something, put our substitute in order. And we will meet that deadline of December 31st and actually do things that help people create jobs and, and, and uh, reduce the deficit and make the doctors available. So if a, a, some, a senior wants to go to a doctor, they'll be able to do it. Look at our substitute and don't continue with this sham. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I would yield one minute to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffin. Gentleman's recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I hear my colleagues uh, speaking about what will pass. Let me tell you that the boiler mac provisions of this bill would pass the Senate if only they were allowed to get a vote. Forty-one members of the Democrat Party voted for boiler mac in this House. Twelve members of the Senate of the Democrat Party are co-patrons of similar language in the Senate. The Boiler Mac provisions of this bill help 
hospitals deal with their increasing costs. It helps universities. It does help business, but it helps businesses large and small. The bill requires reasonable regulations, and it requires reasonable time in which to comply with those regulations. Currently, they're only allowed three years plus possibly a fourth if allowed by the EPA administrator. The bill will allow five years plus reasonable time. And when you're trying to change the way you've been doing things, sometimes you need a little more time to get things done than three years. It was interesting in committee, the EPA came in and was talking to us about projects they were trying to get done and money they'd left on the table. They couldn't get their projects done in three years. How do they expect American businesses to do so and provide jobs? Gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased at this time to yield to the uh, gentlelady from California, the next chair of the Telecommunications Subcommittee, Ms. Eshoo, for two minutes. The gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the ranking member of the committee. Uh, Mr. Speaker, within this bill are provisions on spectrum that will define our nation's ability to lead uh, the world in wireless broadband deployment. It will also define how we will finally, finally provide our first responders with a nationwide interoperable broadband network that the 9-11 Commission called for. I appreciate Chairman Waldman's, uh, uh, Walden's work with the minority, including the agreement on authorizing voluntary uh, incentive spectrum auctions, reallocating the D block for public safety, and providing the initial funding for next generation 9-11. I do have four concerns, and I want to point them out. First, uh, pertaining to the treatment of unlicensed spectrum. Unlicensed spectrum has created an innovative space for entrepreneurs, enabling Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and thousands of other devices and services, all meaning jobs. In fact, last month, the Consumer Federation of America released a new study which found the consumer benefits of unlicensed spectrum surpassing 50 billion, that's with a B, dollars per year. Prohibiting the FCC, the expert agency, from using some of our nation's best airwaves for unlicensed use, as the House language does, is simply foolhardy. Secondly, I'm very concerned about how the bill treats the spectrum that public safety needs to create and manage a nationwide interoperable broadband network. What the Republican bill does, on the one hand, is to give. But on the other hand, it takes away. And this is not a solution, and I don't believe it's fair to public safety in our country. Third, the bill encourages the development of 50 separate networks instead of one nationwide network. Past experiences uh, demonstrate that a state-based approach fails to achieve interoperability. I think it's going to cost money, and uh, I don't think that it's going to work. Lastly, the provisions that restrict the FCC, may I have 10 more seconds? I yield another 30 seconds. Thank you. Lastly, the provisions that restrict the FCC's ability to preserve competition and promote an open Internet simply do not belong in this legislation. I think our country is counting on us to make smart and bipartisan choices. I'm sorry to say that I don't think that this bill meets the standard. I do believe that the Senate accomplished these goals in S-911, and I believe we can too, but not through this bill, and I urge uh, opposition to it for the reasons I stated. Thank you. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, at this point, I'll yield uh, one of my two remaining minutes. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner. Gentleman's recognized one for minute. one minute. I thank the gentleman, the Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, for the time. We've all heard about the need to address jobs, to act on jobs. And so here we are today to address the issue of job creation for so many in this country who are currently unemployed. Perhaps to some, the creation of jobs is just a pipe dream. But to many, Republicans and Democrats, job creation is a keystone pipeline. It's not a pipe dream. In Colorado alone, the Alberta oil sands could create as many as 6,000 jobs in the next four years, and the Keystone Pipeline is an important part of that. We hear over and over again the need to create jobs, the need to address the issue of job creation. And here we are, yet yeah, here we are, hearing opposition to job creation. 
For every dollar we spend on oil from Saudi Arabia, 50 cents is returned to the U.S. economy. For every dollar spent on Canadian oil, 90 cents is returned to the domestic economy. It's because Canada's oil fields, American products are used in mass. Case loaders, Michelin tires, Wolverine boots, Ford trucks, the list goes on. This is not the way it is in countries thousands of miles away. I urge, we, I urge this Congress to put, I urge this Congress not to put <coughs> politics before paychecks. Pass this bill. Time the gentleman's expired. The time of the gentleman from California has expired. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, has five and three quarter minutes remaining. The gentleman from uh, Michigan, Mr. Upton, has one and one half minutes remaining, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, has four and one half minutes remaining. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would yield one minute to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson. Gentleman from Texas, recognized for one minute. I thank the chairman, Mr. Speaker. At a time when our economy is struggling to recover, it's stunning to think that my friends on the other side of the aisle would deny an opportunity to reduce our reliance on Middle Eastern oil and create thousands of American jobs. The Keystone XL pipeline does both. The project has been exhaustively studied and revised to ensure its safety. Our economy needs a safe, reliable source of energy. Canada can't provide it. They want to provide it to help us reduce our reliance on Middle East oil while strengthening our national security. 20,000 new American jobs will be created to build this pipeline. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to pass this bill, approve the Keystone XL pipeline now. I yield back. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I would ask uh, unanimous consent that all of my remaining time be given back to the gentleman from the great state of Michigan, Mr. Camp. Without objection, uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, will have an additional 30 seconds. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. My time. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Camp, wish to yield time. At this time, I yield one minute to the distinguished uh, gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman from Michigan for yielding. And I think one of the strongest components of this bill that we're bringing to the floor today is the jobs component that's contained in the Keystone Pipeline bill. If you look at what we're trying to do, uh, right now we've got some options here. The American people are clamoring for jobs. We've got the ability to force President Obama to get off the sidelines. You know, the president's been good about running all around the country and giving these political speeches and campaigning. And he's talking about jobs and he's talking about the middle class. Yet here we have an opportunity to create 20,000 middle class jobs in America. And the president's saying no. The president's saying he'll veto the bill over this one provision. Now think about that. There's a bill that deals with unemployment benefits, and the president's saying he'd rather people be unemployed than actually get a job. They would much rather have a job than be unemployed, and yet there is the ability to create 20,000 American jobs with the Keystone Pipeline, and the president's turning his back on those middle-class families. There's over $7 billion of private investment. We can increase America's energy security. If that oil comes from Canada, our, our dependence on Middle Eastern oil can drop dramatically. We can eliminate a million barrels a day when this comes online uh, and, and reduce our dependence on Middle Eastern oil. Let's create American jobs. What does President Obama have against 20,000 American jobs? I urge a yes vote and I yield back. Time of the gentleman's expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. It's now my privilege to yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from New York, Charles Rangel. Gentleman from New York, recognized for two minutes. Without objection. I was walking through the uh, Cannon Building to get to one of the television stations, and an elder gentleman stopped me and asked me whether or not they were going to provide the tax benefits and the, uh, the uh, uh, unemployment taxes uh, to them, and trying to find out why we were gridlocked and what the problem was. I assumed he was from my district, but it was in some part of Texas. And so he heard my explanation as to why we were not just passing 
what Democrats believe in and Republicans say they don't have a problem with. And I told him it was about the Keystone Pipeline, and he says, what the hell is that? That made me think. Of all the people in this time of the year with limited resources that are going to sleep tonight, with all of the polls that are saying that the Congress is out of touch with the needs of America, they're not talking about Republicans. They're talking about the Congress, Republicans and Democrats. Is anyone telling me they're providing a break for people that work hard every day, that getting a break on their taxes has to be connected with a pipeline? Are you telling me that if you work every day and through no fault of your own, you've lost your job and that you paid into a fund where you're supposed to get some comfort, that you're telling them that we need the Keystone Pipeline? Let's get real. This is a political thing that's being done not to deliver on the promise that we made to the American people. So let me make a plea that for all of the people that's in need, for all the people that's looking for a little break from big government, for all the people that we made these promises to, say that we couldn't do it because of the Keystone Pipeline. And if you think that makes any sense, then we are just a disgrace to the American people. If you want a Keystone Pipeline, bring it to the floor, let's debate it and vote up and down. But to hold the American people that are suffering in hostage, it is just plain wrong.